Okay, we have now lifted the computer after removing all the rear connector cables onto a work table which is at a nice height. You don't have to bend down and squeeze around etc. Give yourself plenty of room. So first up we're going to remove the side panels. To do so you'll need a Phillips head screwdriver or a small socket. Panels are secured to the chassis of the computer by four Phillips head screws, two on either side. Uh, remove those now. You may just give some thought to um, having your anti-static wrist strap handy as to when you're working on the interior of the computer you need to ensure that you're not going to, for want of a better term, zap out any of the internal components. To remove the side panels, firm grip, pull backwards toward you, lift to disengage the sides from the connector pin and put those panels to one side. Now expose the interior of the cabinet and uh, now you may also want to consider um, vacuuming out any superfluous dust and grime etc. Use a soft brush on the end of the vacuum, be very careful not to overdo it so as to damage any components. Here we're showing that you have four bays on this particular computer. You can use various combinations of Blu-ray, DVD, CD, etc, etc. The CD burner, or in this case a read-only memory, a ROM DVD drive, is secured by four small Phillips head screws. Just remove those, there's two on either side. At the rear of the burner are uh, two cables. In this case it's an IDE burner denoted by the 40 pin ribbon, large wide ribbon cable and you have a 4 pin power cable. Just remove those. Undo the two retaining screws on this side. Then you are able to simply just firmly uh, get your fingers in behind the burner and firmly push them towards the front or out of the chassis. Job done. Now we're going to put a DVD, CD, DVD burner in its place. Again, it's an older type. It's an IDE model. Again, denoted by the 40 pins on the rear of the burner and the 4 pin power cable, which is standard for most components. You will note that there's a small blue section there on the back panel. There's a small pin uh, where you can configure the burner as with a disk drive, an IDE disk drive, to be either the slave drive or the master drive. In all cases you need uh, a master as the primary and a slave as the secondary. Just do up the four small Phillips heads. Don't over tighten the screws. We don't want to do damage to the component. Once done, 
we will then fit the IDE ribbon cable, making sure that the ribbon cable is connected correctly. You will notice on the side of the ribbon cable, normally there is a red ink on one leading edge of the ribbon. You will find that tends to come to the outside of the case, that is where you are standing looking in. And there is a notch on the ribbon cable which slots into the corresponding notch on the rear of the burner. Don't overdo it, don't try and force. There is only one way for both the IDE ribbon cable and the power cable to slot in. On the power connector, more often than not, it's the yellow wire that also goes to the outside. Simple as that, you've now fixed the burner into the cabinet. Just make sure you put the right side on. As you can see there, a lot of cases these days have a funnel shaped aperture to allow the fan on the CPU unit to direct airflow directly onto the heatsink of the CPU. Simply redo the four screws securing the back panel. You will find that they easily fit into their slots and then slide them forward to lock them home. Job nearly done. Another two screws and you're ready to reconnect and then reconfigure the burner in the disk management software of Windows. You'll find when you reboot the computer it will automatically load the driver for that particular burner in this case. You may be prompted to reboot and then you're up and running. Job well done.